Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Gene Friedman, and he's uh, at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University uh, in the Machine Biointerfaces Lab. Uh, so have some really interesting conversations already. We've met a few times in uh, Baltimore and in Sydney, Australia. So that was fun. But uh, Gene, you have some really interesting projects, one especially that I want to talk about. But uh, do you want to introduce yourself better than I just did? Sure. So my name is Gene Friedman. I, I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins University. I am in the School of Medicine, and then I hold uh, a secondary position in secondary appointment in biomedical engineering department. And I specialize in neuroengineering. Cool. And then so you, you talk a lot about uh, electrophysiology, kind of electronics. What I thought was really interesting in your page, you, you talk about how biology and electronics use different ways of communication. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, uh, ions versus electrons? Sure. So I mean, when we talk about neural interfaces and we talk about how machines would interface to neurons, which is really what my laboratory is all about, it's basically a communication between devices that use electrons to communicate between components and really the nervous system, which uses ionic transmission of information. And so when we think about how we can make these two, two entities talk to each other in, a, in sort of a seamless way, we have to think about how, how these two modes of transmission from electrons to ions can work together in sort of a symbiotic way to, to talk to each other. That's kind of my perspective on, on that interface. And I suppose from, as a, as a philosophy in my lab, really what we're looking for is a way to make these two entities communicate to each other seamlessly. And the way I generally put it is my job would be done if I could make the nervous system think that it's talking to another nervous system rather than a, a machine. So, so the goal is to emulate whatever it is that the nervous system would want to see okay yeah that sounds that sounds reasonable and i think you have an idea for how to do this do you want to talk about your your plan it's it's pretty clever i like it sure so i i think you're referring to the freeform stimulator so so the idea that we had and it's sort of the main focus of the laboratory right now is this so conventional neural implants things like spinal cord stimulators and uh, cochlear implants retinal stimulators that sort of thing deep brain stimulators they all have to use pulses delivered to metal electrodes to interface to the body and the reason why they have to use pulses at the metal electrodes is because if you deliver electrical current for too long to a metal electrode that is implanted in the body, what you're going to get is you're going to get electrochemistry. And that electrochemistry will generally, the first thing that will happen is you're going to start forming bubbles because you're going to split water. It's electrolysis. So you clearly don't want to do that in the body. And so all of these devices, because they have a metal electrode implanted near the tissue, they have to use pulses, a charge balanced biphasic pulses. So you deliver electrical current to this piece of metal for, for a little while, and then you have to take it back almost immediately, the same amount of charge. Otherwise, you're going to you know, have these electrons jump across and cause chemical reactions. So, so now because of that, neurons that are affected by these pulses are essentially confined to evoking action potentials. 
So basically, when you want to interface to these neurons, conventional implants generally rely on evoking action potentials. And that can go only so far because you're basically tied to this idea that every time you give a pulse, action potentials go off. And these action potentials are going to affect all of the neurons at the same time. And so you can generally increase activity in sort of this phase-locked fashion. You can't really decrease activity in neurons very easily. And so and so it kind of gives you, you, you you're sort of dealing with this, this set of handcuffs all the time because you, you, you want to do more in principle, but you can't. So the idea that we came up with is... Uh, this freeform stimulator. So what this device does is it's it's essentially a rectifier that converts charge balanced biphasic pulses delivered to metal electrodes. So everything is copacetic, uh, but it does this inside of a device. And then we have machinery in the device that rectifies that electrical current into direct current so that Effectively, what you're doing is you're using two electrodes, and while one is delivering the charge to the body, the other one is getting discharged. And so you, you, you then switch. So you go, one is getting delivering charge to the body, while the second one is getting discharged. And so you basically alternate between these two so that the metal electrodes remain charge balanced, but the output is always in the same direction. Yeah, I, I thought I think it's very clever and and kind of like what you're saying. It's a, it's a rectifier, like a full bridge rectifier, and that they use in electronics, going from AC to DC. So if you want to convert and you want to get a DC output, that's basically what you use. So, is that what the inspiration was? Was you were looking at one of those? So yeah, I suppose the inspiration was that it came from a couple of other. I mean, the idea, the idea kind of originated way back early two thousands with. Spellman, Spellman's lab in, I think it was, it was in Washington. But, but the idea was to see if they could create a, a, essentially a battery for the, for the cochlear, uh, endolymph versus paralymph. There needs to be a potential difference between the two. Uh, and so in, in the inner ear, and so they came up with this idea. So this kind of, this is, you know, all of this kind of followed up. We're, we're way further ahead on, on all of this than, than that original idea, but that's kind of where that came from. But in terms of, so, so just to kind of drive this a little bit further, it's not necessarily charge balanced pulses to DC. The reason why we call it a freeform stimulator is, is this, when you're delivering electrical current from one of the electrodes, you can do anything you want. You, you're, not, you're not confined to delivering direct current. You, you, you can literally do, deliver anything, pulses, whatever you want as long as you account for the amount of charge left on this electrode after you're done. So then you discharge whatever is left over. So you can literally deliver any waveform that you want. So handcuffs are off. You can do anything you like. And so it literally opened up a whole path to all kinds of things we can now do uh, or, or experiment with. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty incredible. I think because you're so in it and, and you are limited by the electrodes so much, you don't even know what could be possible uh, by doing something else. So, so yeah, what, what would be possible actually in this case? I mean, you could just do, you know, a DC, a DC stimulation pulse or not even pulse it'd just be a, a constant, you know, background thing. So, so yeah. And, and what, what would that be good for? And, and uh, yeah, so what, what's possible with this? Um, so uh, let, let me give you some ideas as to what we're experimenting with now. So we have we have uh, a number of projects. So one of them is for a vestibular prosthesis. So it's it's a vestibular prosthesis is a conventional pulse stimulator, IPG, 
an implantable pulse generator that has gyroscopes on it and it, it basically detects the motion of the head and it stimulates the three branches, each of the three branches of the vestibular nerve to give the perception of the direction and velocity of head movement for someone who is suffering from this kind of a balanced disorder. So what one kind of, and, and these, these devices are beneficial to people, but one thing that is clearly a problem is that these devices are not nearly as effective as they could be. And that's been linked to the fact that when uh, a pulse train is delivered to the vestibular nerve, the central nervous system adapts mm -hmm. to the fact that all of these pulses, all of these spikes come in at the same time on a, on a, on a whole population of neurons. And because the central nervous has never seen this before, it adapts by essentially reducing the gain to the input way, way down. And so it literally just says, I don't know what this is, so I'm not going to listen to it. And so what we discovered is that by using by using freeform stimulation, so you instead of delivering pulses, you just deliver you just deliver a to to increase firing rate of neurons, you deliver cathodic depolarizing stimulus and you just hold it and so these neurons basically start firing they're not phase locked to anything because there's no phases to lock onto so they fire with the stochastic properties that they normally naturally have and they increase their firing rate but the other really beautiful thing about this is you can decrease their firing rate from the spontaneous activity so you can you can then introduce an otic uh, current and then you can decrease their firing rate and that gives you the sensation of head turning in the opposite direction. So, so it basically starts creating a much more natural, uh, natural sensation. And, and so, so with this prosthesis, we're, we're able to see, you know, effectiveness improvements two to three uh, times what you can do with a pulsatile stimulation. So that's one area. Second area is we discovered that we can influence pain at the peripheral nerve. And so by introducing hyperpolarizing current to the peripheral nerve and it's and and what we're seeing is it's affecting the small caliber neurons much more so which carry pain much more so than the larger neurons that carry other information and so we're able to block pain at the peripheral nerve which is uh, which is you know sort of an incredible discovery we didn't know about this it was completely uh, you know a uh, surprise to us so that work is going on. And then I can tell you the new stuff uh, that we have going on, which is that uh, we are now able to modulate excitatory to inhibitor ratio in, in the cortex, which is uh, really exciting because this, this kind of, it's a network property of a bunch of neurons that are excitatory, some are inhibitory. And when you put them together, you get this, ratio of how easy it is to excite a certain area of the cortex and this this property has been linked to multiple neurological disorders uh, you know there's uh, everything from depression to to uh, autism to schizophrenia and, and epilepsy and so we have recently shown that we can modulate that property to change the behavior, this sort of this basic behavior of excitatory to inhibitory ratio. And so that kind of opened up a whole a whole new opportunity for us. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. That's almost like you said, it's kind of using the natural bodies, you know, way of doing things versus just overriding it, overwriting it as well. And mm -hmm 
just you know screaming down you know a tube or something like this what you want to say versus versus amplifying what what the body's natural or or decreasing deamplifying whatever the the body's going to do so this is many electrodes you know deep brain stimulators and and peripheral nerve stimulators kind of what you were saying is is they can be very small you know sub millimeter and and you know smaller than the diameter of a human hair but your device is a little bit bigger how big is it and why does it need to be that size so the issue is so the device itself we're you know we're we're getting it to an implantable size it's it's you know it's going to be it's going to be on the order of a centimeter ish the device itself we're trying to put in uh, multiple channels in the device the biggest problem that you have is you have so so the device converts electronic currents so electrons that are moving in 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 wires to ionic currents so this is ions moving inside of a some kind of uh, electrolytic conduit which is you know you can think of as a as a as a tube or or you know you can imagine a a, a tube filled with electrolytic gel say that needs to carry that to the body or to the to the target so the issue that you end up with that is electrons going through a wire have very low uh, resistance right? so they, they can easily flow through a wire even if that wire is very thin the problem with ions is they're flowing in this electrolytic environment and and the resistance is much much higher and so resistance in any conduit is proportional to to the the width of the diameter of that of that conduit and so the you know or inversely proportional so if you make that conduit thinner then your resistance starts going up and so basically what that implies is the 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 smaller the width of your delivery mechanism you know that interface the higher the impedance the higher the resistance that you have to deal with and so if you want to deliver a certain amount of current then ohm's law basically says that the voltage would have to go up for the same amount of current as you increase the resistance so you you make it very thin wires thin tubes then all of a sudden you have to have much larger voltage so so that that it becomes one of the constraints that we have to uh, deal with and but but fortunately the what we're finding out is so the, the, there's some interesting things you can think about in this case so you can use you're absolutely right you can use tiny stimulation uh, uh, the tiny wires, let's say, to interface to neurons, and you're going to get, you're still not at the level of neurons. You're still on the level of, say, hundreds of neurons. Right? So, I mean, we're, so we're on the level of thousands of neurons. But the thing about it is, you know, when you're dealing with this, so you, you're affecting your population. So you have to think of ways of dealing with a population of neurons you're always dealing with a population so so then then you have to start thinking in those terms you're not talking to individual neurons so the question then becomes how can you possibly let's say make some population of neurons fire while not the other population of neurons well this becomes a very interesting problem because because really what population do you want to talk to as an example let's think about the retina okay the retina has on cells and off cells it has many other kinds of retinal ganglion cells but but you could divide it up uh, along the lines of on cells and off cells one way you could potentially address just the on cells Right. This has been a, a major problem in, in retinal prosthetics. How do you address just the on cells within your target area? How do you address just the off cells? Because the two behave exactly in the opposite way. 
So you shine a light, on cells turn on, off cells turn off. When you turn the light off, it goes the other way around. So now the question is, how do you address one versus the other? Because if you if you make both of them fire, like with a ret, you know, general retinal prosthesis, the brain just goes, what am I doing? I, I don't understand this. And so, and so that is really the problem. It's not, it's not which neurons fire, it's which types of neurons fire, which is a very different problem. And so now what we're, the way we're addressing this is not by trying to get down to individual neurons, which has been sort of the direction that the field has been trying to go. But instead of that, we're starting to look at what are the properties of these two types of neurons that we can use within our stimulation paradigm? Because now we don't have any handcuffs. Now we can deliver any stimulus that we want. So the question is, how do these two different types of neurons react to changing electric fields such that we can make these fire while these don't fire and vice versa? And so it becomes a different problem, and we start thinking in, 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 along those lines. Yeah, for sure. It definitely opens up the, the the amount of things that you can do with it. And that might even be a problem because, you know, in the past, we, were, we could do different stimulation patterns and frequencies and all this kind of stuff. And you're, you're adding another dimension to that. So you're, you're complicating it even more. But I think it, it does add more flexibility. So that is good. And now a word from our sponsor. SciTech Nano provides custom solutions for neural interface hardware design, development, fabrication, and testing. SciTech Nano specializes in microfabrication in perylene and polyamide, thin film ceramics, and conducting polymers. If you need custom neural interface hardware made with quality at an affordable price, you should contact SciTech Nano in the heart of Central Europe in Brno, Czech Republic. Now, back to the show. Yeah, so this is this is really interesting. Okay, so so you you also have another project, and I, I thought it was really interesting. And in addition to being you know a professor, you have a, a startup company called Adar. Do you want to talk about this? <laughs> well, I can tell you about it. It kind of sprung up out of completely any everything that's unrelated to what I've been doing. But Basically, the, the idea behind ADAR came up a long time ago, probably 10 years ago. I, I, I kind of felt a little frustrated with uh, being in a school of medicine, but not being a doctor and not knowing exactly how to decide on medical issues, whether or not I should take my kids to a doctor or, or, or not. And so I decided to, uh, that it would be helpful to build some kind of a device that could tell me that rather than me calling my colleagues and asking them. And so that kind of, that idea kind of brought around this, this uh, device called the mouth lab. And, and so this is a device that uh, you, you basically obtain a whole lot of biomedical measurements from the mouth and from, and from your hand as you're holding this device and and as a result, then you can, you, you, you know, and, and it, it turned out the way the company kind of grew, it, it became really a device for sick people, for people with chronic illnesses. And so if they use the device a couple of times a day, you can detect changes to their health over, over days of use, and you can flag if there is a problem and so that's that's the main idea behind this technology and and everything that we're doing so so hopefully you know we'll be seeing this device in nursing homes and and for people who are sort of sort of suffering at home from chronic illnesses to, to keep them from having to to uh, get hospitalized yeah, before we started recording, you you had described it as like a tricorder, like in Star Trek, where they they have one medical tool and they're able to diagnose any problems. So similar to this, yeah. are you doing any nerve stuff with it yet? <laughs> no, we're not. So right now, so right now everything is biophysical. So we're we're detecting uh, we're detecting all of the sort of the standard things you would think about. So there's with oxygen saturation, there's uh, pulse rate, heart rate, electrocardiogram, um, 
there's temperature, there's, uh, what else do we have? Uh, breathing patterns, breathing rate, uh, and you have, you have a lung, lung function to detect whether or not your lungs are affected. So we, all of this is kind of, you know, this is over, so all of this is over like 30 seconds or you, you would call, or, or a minute. So you hold this in your mouth, kind of like a toothbrush. The idea is you, you, you'd use it every morning or every evening or both in your bathroom and put it back in charger. And so, so with that, then we, we, you know, the, the idea, the reason why we went to the mouth is because the mouth has saliva and breath, which have biomarkers. So the idea is in the long run to actually do, but you know, by chemical analysis, uh, to add to to add out to 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 this massive collection. So the idea, the 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 main idea behind all of this is to collect as many parameters as possible, and just out comes just one. Just are you okay? You're not okay. What's your, what's your level of health? And so, and so, and so we have, we have the analysis, you know, nailed down and now we basically need to build in more, more sensors, more, you know, more stuff to collect. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's, it looks like you guys have gotten some, some grants for it and everything like this, but that is, that is pretty impressive, you know, professor and you're working on this freeform stimulator and then doing a startup. How how do you also have a startup on the side as well? I have I have a very good CEO. I, I got lucky. It's a person who's has got a degree in biomedical engineering and and he's got an M MBA and he's he's been working in in this kind of space for for a while and so he's very driven. But it's really mostly him. Um, I, you know, I, I'm the CTO, I, I drive the technical, you know, branch of this and, and we have, you know, we have people working. So basically we just, we direct the direction that we have to go. And was that, so this wasn't something that you had worked on in the lab or something. This was just a, a side project that you had done that, that you hadn't necessarily, come up with data like like the data for it you you came up with on your on your own not through john hopkins right so so how did the the ceo find out about it it wasn't like his phd project or anything right no i i he was in an mba pro i met him because he was in an mba program and i had uh, the school of the business school asked me to give a talk on uh, to their entrepreneurship class on on this technology that i was trying to that I was trying to create as a as a as a medical device, and and so he was he was in that class, and he approached me afterwards, and we kind of got going from there. Well, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, so so that's that's a great way to you know have a lot of projects going, find somebody who's really talented, and and <laughs> have them run it. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, that's that's. That's generally how professors work, right? You, you, you know, most professors stop doing actual work <laughs> after they get done with their postdoc, and they start they start recruiting talent and giving ideas. That's funny. That that sounds fun. <laughs> that sounds it easy. Is fun. It's, it's, it's fantastic, really. Yeah. So so let let's maybe talk broadly too. What what are some big challenges in in both this freeform stimulator or maybe ADAR, you know, the whatever is occupying the most of your mind at, at this point. Well, in in ADAR, it's it's so company is is a lot different from research. Company has to make money. It has to be much closer to a finished product. So the work that we do here is primarily development that's based on already tested technologies. So we find tested technologies that work and then we adapt them to the device and that's how the device evolves. In, in the laboratory doing research, you're, you're constantly at the forefront 
where nobody's ever walked before. It's just a completely different perspective, completely different uh, way of approaching problem solving. And so, so the two are different. And, you know, in a business, it has to make money. It has to be, you know, the reliability is number one priority in business in in an industry and in the laboratory number one priority is what can you do that has never been done and it's really one of a you know sort of a proof of concept is is huge and then that can potentially grow into something or or not or or change over so so it's a balance i guess for me you know I spent probably most of my time in the laboratory, but yeah, I have heard that running a lab is very similar to running a startup because you know you have this you know income and you have to manage people and you have financials and and so there is there is a lot of overlap. One is you know maybe primarily to make money later on, but but they, they have a lot of the same fundamentals. They they do, but it they do, but like I said, it's the perspective that's different. So there are people coming in who need they need income, so you need to bring money in, and so in the laboratory you bring money in from grants because you you're basically trying to convince your colleagues that uh, you, what you're doing is important uh, for humanity. What you're doing is important for the field. And so you try to get funding from government agencies generally. And that money serves to pay the people who do the, the job, usually students. And and then, you know, and then the output of that is our papers, that uh, manuscripts that, that basically inform the world of, of these new ideas and how well they work. In the business world, you know, you, you try to get money in, hopefully by selling something. And if you don't sell something, you can also get grants. We just got, you know, we have NIH grants. We have NSF grants in in the company also. We have investors. But your output is is a, is a medical device that's going to be saw, sold and, and, and go into people's hands and and you know it's 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 really selling things it's not uh it's uh, your output is not manuscripts it's a it's it's a thing that you know, goes to people and hopefully helps them yeah definitely yeah, i've heard it called different currencies you have you have a uh, things different things you're, you're trying to uh uh think about well uh, gene this has been this has been a lot of fun uh i think this is really good is there anything that we didn't talk about uh that you wanted to mention <laughs> no, not particular. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Sure. Lynn. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.